Well, good afternoon. This is Dyke Hendrickson, the host of the podcast, Life Along the Merrimack. We talk about the health and history of the Merrimack River. And today our topic is gonna be women, women of the river. Um, Women did not play a large role if you go back several hundred years. They were not captains of vessels. Um, They rarely went out on a vessel unless your husband was captain. But I think it's useful to talk about what roles women did have in past years, and then we'll go to some Coast Guard uh, women who have been instrumental in changing the Coast Guard. And this is 96.3 radio, it's Joppa radio, seen on Channel 9 as well. Uh, Here we have uh, a remarkable um, statue in Haverhill. Now I might mention that I have just written a book titled New England Coast Guard Stories, Remarkable Mariners. And as part of some of the Coast Guard things that I've learned, and also another book that I wrote, Merrimack, The Resilient River, I've learned quite a bit about who was on the rivers in the old days. And here's a story of a woman that goes way back to 1697. So Hannah Dustin, you might be able to um, see that name uh, in this statue in Haverhill, and the city hall is in the background, incidentally. She was um, happily living in Haverhill. She had seven or eight kids, had a nice husband, and she um, was alone near the farmhouse one day with her son and her two-week-old baby. And some Native Americans came along and kidnapped Hannah. They killed her little two-week-old baby. Uh, The boy um, survived, and they were kidnapped and taken upriver to New Hampshire. Now, As the tale goes, Hannah woke up in the middle of the night in New Hampshire, and she picked up a ax, which you can see in her right hand, and she proceeded to kill 10 Native Americans. And beyond that, she scalped them. So she was able to bring back the scalps, make some money. Her 10-year-old or 12-year-old son lived. Um, It was very unfortunate about her baby, and I guess unfortunate about the 10 Native Americans who lost their scalps. But this is one of the more curious stories of women on the river. Um, This happened in 1697, as we say, a a statue was put up about a century later. And um, it was believed to be the first statue of a woman in the United States. And so um, here it was, Hannah Dustin from Haverhill, kidnapped (laughs) to New Hampshire, uh, became quite a hero. Uh, way long ago. Another uh, woman from the past is Ellen Swallow Richards. She was a scientist and she brought clean water to the Merrimack River. Now, even today, 500,000 people, that is a large number, 500,000 people are getting their drinking water from the Merrimack River. It is clean now, there are many good scientists. But in about 1890, and around Lawrence and Lowell, uh, the you know scientists said they were cleaning the water for for uh, drinking, but um, many there are many cases of typhoid and diphtheria. Ellen Swallow Richards. Now Swallow is a good name <laughs> if you're involved in drinking water. Ellen Swallow Richards was a very brilliant woman. She was the first female graduate of MIT. This is about in 1873. She actually went on and earned enough credits to get an advanced degree from MIT, but they didn't give them in those days. But those are good creds. She was very brilliant. She came up from Cambridge with several others. Uh, They were, you know, smart men. They knew their water. They knew their clarification. And they were able to make studies of the water and make it cleaner. Now, one element of this was people, working people who lived on the river, were getting the water almost straight from the river and it wasn't very clean. Wealthier people lived away from the river and they had their own wells. So for years, typhoid and diphtheria uh, were were big dangers, but then Ellen Swallow Richards and her team came along and about 1893, they brought forth a new um, science for cleaning drinking water. And it was picked up in Lowell and in Boston And it really became a form for uh, communities all over the country. It was a really amazing thing. Very few people know this, but 
That will be brought out in my book, Merrimack, The Resilient River. We have, you know, another um, wonderful picture of Ida Bowes. She was from uh, Rhode Island. She lives uh, in Newport, really, at the lighthouse. And her family ran the lighthouse because they didn't let women actually have jobs in the water. But she was a real hero in Newport Harbor because she saved many people. She had a, a vessel, she had five or six volunteers. And when a ship would go down, they go out and help as they could. If people went in the water, if they, you know, sometimes in those rocks in Newport, you know, you're just a big wave comes in, you're carried in. But Ida Bowles was a very uh, prominent person in the mid 19th century and was quite well known. Here is a photo of women from the 40s. They're, they're in the Coast Guard, they're called spars. Um, Semper paratus, always ready, is what spars is kind of an acronym for. And, you know, they, as soon as the war broke out, they joined the Coast Guard. Now, the Coast Guard had very few women um, before World War II. But during this period of time, 1941 to 1945, the Coast Guard took in 12,000 women. Isn't that remarkable? I mean, just as an administrative task, to, you know, to interview them, to do the paperwork, to assign them, to get them uniforms. But they were terrific workers, kind of, you know, the nautical version of Rosie the Riveter. You remember that character um, who went into the aircraft carriers and uh, did a lot of construction during the war. Well, these were clerical aides and were very helpful um, in Boston, in New London, in many of the communities. Curiously, and after 1945, they're all mustered out. So there really wasn't a chance for them to make a career, which is kind of sad. And the Coast Guard did not really take women back until 1976. That was the year that the, the um, Coast Guard Academy in New London, Connecticut um, decided to take women. There were 39 women in the first class, 13 graduated, which I think is very laudable. <laughs> and so women started as officers in the Coast Guard in 1976. Today, there are about 42,000 active Coasties and about 6,000 are women. So it's still a low number, but um, it is growing. And I understand that last year's class at the Coast Guard Academy had 40% women. So that's a big change that Coast Guard women are joining, they're becoming officers and um, they've really helped the Coast Guard along. Now, I, in my book, um, New England Coast Guard Stories, I did interview a number of folks um, all around New England. This is Kelly Denning. She was in Boston. She's an officer, a lieutenant. And she was, um, she took a special program. The Coast Guard is trying to encourage uh, women, uh, men and women, but especially women, to be able to have a family and continue your career. So uh, Kelly Denning took advantage of a program. She had had a couple kids and she was probably going nuts. And, um, you know, there was a program that she could take off two years and stay at home. And then she could come back, re resume her uh, particular um, office. And, and so she could just get her family straightened out. And she really appreciates the program. Now she was married to a Coastie, which ha is very, helpful for this program. But Kelly was one that said she benefited from a program that enabled her to stay home with the kids for a few years and then come back to the Coast Guard. Lori Fields is uh, a commissioned off non-commissioned officer. Um, she was in South Portland, Maine when I talked to her. And I must say my book about the Coast Guard, New England Coast Guard stories is about Coasties in New England <laughs> or so I thought. But in fact, Coasties are moved every two or three years. Sometimes they're lucky and can stay in the same place for a while. Um, families with kids like to do that because if you have their, your kids in a school, it's a lot easier. But she was from, um, she was from Spokane, Washington. And this is about 18 or 20 years ago. And she's reading the paper. 
and done a couple of years in college, <clears throat> didn't have a job really. And there was a wanted ad and it said, you know, young women to join exciting profession. And, you know, she thought, uh oh, they they want me for a cocktail waitress or worse. But this wasn't the case. It was the Coast Guard looking for particular people. And Lori Fields followed up. She was taken into the Coast Guard. She was actually in pretty good shape, she said. She had been running, she had been swimming. So when they had the physical fitness test of it, she did well. So I saw her in South Portland, Maine. She had been in for 18 years. You can see by the stripes that she's been very successful. She was in logistics. And she was a type of Coastie who is going to spend most of their career on land. Uh, some people, in fact, officers especially who want to rise in rank, have to go out on the sea. And they have to be involved in, <clears throat> I wouldn't say, um, inimical activity or shooting of drug dealers, but they have to go out to sea. As it turns out, Lori spent most of her time in South Portland on land, although the last time I emailed her, she had been transferred to Honolulu, which is a very large um, site. So from South Portland, Maine to Honolulu is about as far as you can go. But the Coast Guard is an exciting field for women. Uh, she is also married to a Coastie, a retired Coastie, actually. So. Um, they evidently can make it work, and she was in Honolulu the last time I heard. And Megan Cahoon was in Rockland, Maine. She was a graduate of Ohio Wesleyan University. She wants to be a teacher. She went into the Coast Guard and is was a number three um, non-commissioned officer when I was there. So she really likes working with the young Coasties. And you must remember, like, they have about 33 Coasties assigned to Rockland. It's a big station. But there's always new people coming in, you know. And so there always has to be someone to show them the ropes, to get them, you know, up to speed on what they have to do, where they live. In most cases, at least in Rockland and in Newburyport, they don't live in a barracks. They find other, um, they find their apartments or they'll get three or four people together and take a house. And I mentioned that because. When I interviewed Megan, um, she was the only woman of 33 Coasties. So you can understand if there's a whole dorm of men and Megan, it could be awkward. But she had her own place. She really liked the Coast Guard. She was going to make it a career, at least perhaps for 20 years. But she does want to get back to teaching. Now we change pace a little bit and we talk about other women on the river. And in recent years, um, women, especially women legislators, legislators, have been very helpful in trying to get laws passed that'll keep the river clean. This is State Senator Diana DiZoglio. She's from Methuen. Um, she's one of the hardest workers um, and activists in favor of the river. And this is a very unusual photo. Um, they, a group called the Voy Voyagers, about 15 or 16 um, elected officials, city managers, um, educators got together last summer and they took, they went from Franklin, New Hampshire to Newburyport, all the way down the river. It starts in Franklin and ends in Newburyport. It's 117 miles. And so there were a lot of surprises along the way. And this was one of them when Diana DiZoglio and uh, came around a band, there was, you know, a whole herd of cattle in the water. And um, they didn't charge the kayaks, by the way, but it, it um, puzzled everybody for a moment. The photographer and fellow in the stern is Dan Grovac, who is the chair of the Merrimack uh, River Watershed Council. But here's Diane DiZoglio enjoying her day, perhaps a little surprised to see so many uh, bovines, but um, she went on and uh, she was one who did the whole 117 miles. They were about 30 miles a day. They stayed over in parks, in a gymnasium. The problem was they thought they'd just camp on a different field or a different ballpark or a you know, city park, but it rained very hard two nights. And so 
Um, it was a tough run, but um, they really did a good job. And here, again, we see uh, the Voyagers. Here are two very robust and cheerful Voyagers right at the moment. Diana DiZoglio, who we just mentioned, is in the bow, uh, and State Representative Jim Kelkors is in the stern. Now, most of the uh, kayaks going down, and there were, say, 12 to 15 on a given day, were singles, but obviously they have uh, found a tandem two-seater, and so they're coming down the river. And Jim Kelkors um, is a rather large specimen. He did very well in the river, I'm told, and he used to play football for Villanova. And so he was competitive. You know, he had a lot of muscle strength to keep the kayak going. And as I understand it, um, they had quite a good time. And it looks at by seeing this picture. Now, here are a couple other people I wanted to talk about who are doing good things for the river. This is Congresswoman Lori Trahan. She's from the Lowell area. And she is really leading the North Shore delegation in trying to get more money from the federal government to improve sewage treatment plants. What is happening is that as a result of climate change, we're getting in the early spring and summer um, bursts of water. We get a lot of rain at short period of time. The rainwater is picked up and generally taken down to the sewage treatment plant and it goes into the same plant as the sewage does. So if you have thousands of gallons of rainwater merging with many thousands of gallons of effluent, the um, building can't take it all and it has to be released. Uh, so you have so raw sewage going out with rainwater. Now the Environmental Protection Agency knows about this. Um, they're trying to improve it. Um, and they're trying to get more money so some of these treatment plants can be improved. But Lori Trahan, the congresswoman from the Lowell area, is working very hard. In fact, she said at one of the events, uh, I'm, a, I'm a journalist, and so I cover events when they have public people trying to make statements or do better. And she said, you know, it's my first term in Washington, and they call me the sewage lady because I'm always talking about clean water, how we can improve sewage treatment plants. Now she is a former All-American volleyball player. And so um, she's been in her first term and has done a lot for the river. Mayor Donna Holliday uh, has also done a lot for uh, the Merrimack River. She, um, I covered Newbury Porch about six or seven years for the Daily News here in town and sometimes I would ride with her when we, after a big storm. And there have been times when our Newburyport Harbor has been brown as a result of these um, CSOs, the combined sewage uh, overflows, which I just mentioned. And, you know, she has said this and she's written letters and talked to other officials upstream saying, you know, we're at the end of the line, we're getting all your sewage. So you people in Lowell and Lawrence and Haverhill and Manchester, New Hampshire, would you please keep working on a plan to have a better sewage treatment program underway? Now, I might mention Manchester, New Hampshire um, recently had a agreement with the Environmental Protection Agency for a 20-year program to improve and cut down on putting sewage into the river, which is a wonderful thing. It's gonna cost $232 million, but um, there's a low interest rate. It's only 1.5% interest. So if you're committed to it, there are low interest rates out there. And Donna Holiday is a mayor who, you know, she had a $30 million improvement to the treatment plant down on uh, Water Street. Um, she even put an extra million dollars in of technology that takes the odor away after local residents complain. So she's done quite a lot for clean water. Here are some of the all-stars that were involved in um, the Voyagers. Um, and they, these are the ones who did all, all four days and did 117 miles. So we've mentioned a couple of them. 
the left is Diana Dizoglio. Then there's Derek Mitchell. He heads the Lawrence Partnership. Then there's Lane Glenn, president of Northern Essex Community College. <laughs> As you might guess, he's the one holding the pennant. But uh, he, he did all four days. Heather McMahon, she is the director of Groundwork Lawrence. Jim Kelkors, who we mentioned, he's a state rep representing Newburyport, Amesbury, and Salisbury. And then we have state representative uh, Christina Minacucci, who represents the North Andover area. We have Dan Grovick in the cap there, who, first of all, is a great photographer. He's lending me 12 or, 12 or 14 wonderful photos from my book, but he is the chairman of the Merrimack Valley Water, Merrimack River Watershed Council. So he's an important guy and he made the whole trip himself as well. Then there's Dugan Sherwood in the sunglasses off on the right. He uh, he's actually wrote a long essay on what the trip meant to him. And I have that in my book, um, which is coming out in March. And finally on the right is Doug Sparks. He is the editor of Merrimack Valley Magazine. He made a couple of days, but I love his T-shirt. That's um, Henry David Thoreau on his T-shirt. And way back when, and this, this is 1839, uh, Thoreau wrote a book called um, Two Weeks on the Merrimack and Concord Rivers. It was written in 1839. It's published in 1849. But way back in 1839, when he came up the Concord River and had enjoyed it, but when he got to the Merrimack River and he entered the area where Lowell was just putting up many, many mill buildings, and this is, um, he just said, this is gonna be very bad for the fish, very bad for the quality of the water. And this is 1839, mind you. And he was right, because Lowell has put many locks and dams in there. The fish cannot get up the river anymore. They are trying to do things. They have, you know, fish elevators and things like that. But, you know, I just think of Thoreau all those many years ago, uh, 1839, said this is going to be very bad for the fish and very bad for the quality of the water. Now, Lowell started its, its um, building mills on the Merrimack in about 1823 and they kept building for many years. Lawrence started building about 1845 and was incorporated in 1847. So this is a 19th century situation. Um, Thoreau thought it was gonna be bad for the fish and I think he was right. Here's just a favorite shot that I put in. Um, it's not necessarily relating to the river except um, this is from about 1844. It's from the female high school in Newburyport. Now Newburyport had a lot of orphans um, in part because ships would leave for the, the Far East or to Russia or whatever. Um, some of them never came back and say you can have 20 or 40 or 90 men on a ship. And again, there are no women. Um, and so if the ship was lost, we have some orphans. Um, there are even more fishing vessels in Newburyport. Some would be day trippers, some would go to the Outer Banks, some would go, would go up to Nova Scotia. But um, many of those never came back. Um, the weather in the North Atlantic, as you might know, can, very, can be very tempestuous. And I, there's uh, many stories of the Yankee Gale of about 1851 where hundreds of boats from the North Shore, not just Newburyport, but Portsmouth, Portland, Marblehead, whatever, hundreds of boats were out there fishing away. And this tremendous storm came up and 92 fishing vessels were lost, 92. And of those 92, 24 were from Newburyport. So you can see how many men were lost. Say there's two to five uh, men in each boat, you're, you're thinking dozens of men or brothers or uh, fathers or, you know, breadwinners of some nature were gone. But anyway, they created a girls, a female high school. 
It was created in about 1844. And there were schools for girls. It wasn't the first, you know, girls could study French, they could study dance. But this was the first tax supported school um, in the Eastern colonies, and which probably means United States. This was tax supported money. The girls went to school, not just for dance, but for English and math and foreign languages. And they really got gussied up in those days. <laughs> I mean, the dresses are very beautiful. And, you know, it must have been a wonderful place. The school was closed in about 1866 due to a word we've heard before, consolidation. You know, they felt, why should we have, you know, a girls' school over here if we build a larger school? We can get more students, blah, blah, blah. And so that the school ended in about 1866 on its own volition. And several years later, it burnt down. It was located on Washington Street, kind of near where um, some of the smaller restaurants are, where the um, rail trail goes through on Washington Street. That's where it was. And um, it burnt down, was never seen again. But this is one of my favorite photos of the images that I've come across in my, in my day. And so, you know, I'm, as I go along and think about women in the community, you know, they, it's so different now, of course, but they didn't go out on boats unless your husband was the captain or your little tot. A woman named Elizabeth Bray and her daughter went out with, in about 1856. The Maritime Museum down here in Newburyport has a diary. It has some wonderful elements that show that they went out. But this is a situation where women were mostly on land and uh, until recent years. And the Coast Guard, as we've just said, is part of that too. They didn't really take women until, as we say, 1976 when officers were permitted in and then a lot of enlisted. So that's life along the Merrimack. Um, this is 96.3 radio, it's Joppa Radio and Channel 9. And each week we're here and we talk about different elements of the Newburyport and what's happened uh, on the river and throughout it. Now I've, you know, I'm privileged to be speaking later in the week. I'm going to be speaking to the Maine Maritime Museum in Bath, Maine. It's a, uh, a Zoom presentation. I was scheduled to actually be there, but I'm doing it through Zoom. But I'm very, I feel privileged to be able to talk about it. I'll be talking about the Coast Guard and its birth here. And um, I have many slides for that, and I'll show them in the future. But thank you for being with us. Uh, you know, this is once a week. We get together, and we talk about some of the old elements of uh, Newburyport. And this particularly, particular uh, shot is something I really like. Here are more of the voyagers. Here's Mayor Donna Holliday. Um, here is... Um, Lori Trahan, a congresswoman, Jim Kelso, Hal Corson, Diana, Diana, <laughs> Diana with the herd of unsuspecting cows. And here are a couple of coasties that I interviewed for my book on the Coast Guard. All in all, it's a very interesting past. I hope you'll see our show again or listen to it again because uh, much has happened on the Merrimack River. Life along the Merrimack River, the podcast is designed to talk about the history and health of the river, and we'll be back next week. Thank you very much. Uh, we're leaving now, and we'll be able to talk to you again in the future. Thank you.